How's it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. Excited to have another guest. This is Steph Shearer. She's the founder and president of the Americans for Safe Access. And this is the largest national member-based organization of patients, medical professionals, scientists, and concerned citizens promoting safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. Very excited to talk with her about the latest trends, what's going on in the medical industry. How are you doing today, Steph? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited to talk with you. I actually found you on LinkedIn. Uh, somebody was uh, messaging saying that you are an organization that accepts and kind of depends on donations. Do you want to talk a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, I think you know when when we started the organization in 2002, um, you know, at the time there were only 11 dispensaries in the entire country, um, and they were actually all operating illegally at the state and federal level. And, um, you know, we were sort of a coalition of patients and providers and, um, and other patient organizations, uh, but it was always important for us to be able to keep our independence, right? So we, we are not an extension of cannabis businesses. We are not an extension of government. Um, you know, we're um, working with all of these stakeholders, but doing so from a patient perspective. And so that means that, you know, um, I always tell people you can uh, spend a dollar from five million people the same as you can from five, five million dollars from one person. Uh, but the difference is one person doesn't decide if your organization exists. So uh, we very much, um, you know, love being in this role where we can look out for patients' interests. But that means um, that our membership and our and small donations are really our lifeblood. Yeah, that's really uh, that's, that's good to know. And, uh, do you want to kind of uh, follow up on kind of what you do, kind of what where your money goes when you donate to ASA? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's evolved over the years, and I think the the best way to sort of look at that narrative is looking at the word the keyword safe <laughs> in our in our name. Uh, we originally came up with the name Americans for Safe Access. Um, is when we started, actually, Asa Hutchinson was head of the DEA, and we were really starting a, an education campaign about what was happening in California. Uh, and so we were Asa versus Asa, right? And so back then when we were looking at um, safe, we were really talking about safe from uh, federal raids, right? Safe from uh, federal interventions. But the other part of safe is really look the access component. So when I became a patient in in 2000, um, you know, my my doctor brought it up to me. I was having issues with um, my kidneys because of a side effect of anti-inflammatories that I was on. And, you know, I was in Southern California. So when he told me um, that he didn't really know anything about cannabis, but that I was running out of options and he knew that, he, you know, a couple other patients had tried it. And if I could find some, I should try it. Actually, I thought he was trying to score weed for me when he started <laughs> talking to me about it. I had no idea why he was asking me about my cannabis use. Um, and, you know, I was in my early 20s in Southern California, so uh, it wasn't that hard. You know, I caught, you know, talked to some friends of mine that listened to reggae and, um, and eventually found it. But then I had to deal with the fact that I needed it every day, right? And, and so um, as I learned more about, you know, why this was illegal um, you know, why um, it wasn't being dispensed in a way that I could uh, easily find it, you know, I, I realized that, that there were millions of Americans that could benefit from cannabis, but maybe didn't have a, a friend in their 20s that listened to reggae. And so um, I found these collectives up in the Bay Area that were distributing cannabis amongst their members, um, but were the, the targets of these DEA raids. And so um, we quickly started creating these access laws, which are the basis of the distribution you see now in the United States. Uh, and we wanted to find a way that, that patients could safely access cannabis to so get them sort of off of the, the battlefield of the war on drugs, but also, you know, start working on creating product safety protocols in ways that, um, you know, cannabis could move from you know, small production into larger production, uh, but make sure that, um, contaminants and adulterants weren't making it into the end product. Yeah. And over time, that safe has also um, evolved into, you know, looking at, at someone's life. So as long as cannabis is um, 
illegal federally um, or not recognized officially as a, as a medicine, you know, uh, patients are not allowed a lot of basic rights um, that other Americans are. So they're not able to live in uh, subsidized housing. They're not able to um, get their doctor's visits. They talk about cannabis covered under Medicare. Um, they have to pay out of pocket for um, their medication. They're not able to utilize um, uh, the Veterans Administration uh, health programs. Uh, they're not even allowed to own a gun. So I think that, um, and that's a whole other safety issue we won't get into, but um, but I think over over time, um, the, you know, the integrating cannabis into our healthcare system uh, has meant that we worked on different things. So over the years, you know, we've, we've um, back when there were federal raids, we organized um, emergency responses to the raids. So we had text message alert systems where patients would go and protest um, during a raid to make sure that people that were um, caught up in the raid were safe. We, we educated them on, you know, how to successfully um, go through a raid, you know, what to say. They say a lot of clever role plays on making sure they just said that, you know, they, that they only asked for an attorney and chose to remain silent. Um, and that also evolved into training patients to advocate for themselves. So over the years, I have trained hundreds of thousands, no exaggeration, um, of patient advocates about sort of demystifying the, the legislative system and how to advocate for themselves, how to be citizen lobbyists and, and get involved. Um, and we've also had to sue just about every single agency you can imagine um, to um, have the states actually implement these laws. Uh, and today we're doing a, a lot of work on, on educating patients and consumers about what's in their cannabis and how to navigate these sort of confusing markets uh, as well as pushing for federal legislation that would actually integrate cannabis into our healthcare systems. Well, that's awesome. And so you said you started in 2002. And so it sounds like uh, the ASA kind of started based on a personal issue that you were having with your health and being rec recommended to try out cannabis. And then it just turned into this massive, almost national movement. And so I did want to kind of congratulate you um, and thank you for kind of spearheading cannabis and making it mainstream. Uh, th thanks a lot. Of course. No, th thank you for that. I will say I didn't do it alone. Um, we've, we definitely have worked with lots of members. Um, and I think that, um, you know, on one hand, I know that we have done a lot. We've had a lot of successes. Uh, but I also realize that, you know, still for many people, cannabis is not an option. And um, I think if we were to stop the work that we were doing today, um, I would have to change the name of the organization to privileged Americans for safe access <laughs> because unless you can, unless you can afford to pay out of pocket or, um, you know, change a job if it's drug testing or, um, you know, move, uh, to, to a place where, where your, uh, cannabis use is, is tolerated or, you know, live somewhere that will allow you to use it. You know, that's a very privileged way to, uh, to be able to choose your medicine. So, there's still a, a lot to do. Yeah, and that's that's the good news is I think it'll be never ending. But uh, well, let's talk about some successes that we've had. So we've been in, you've been doing this since 2002. What are some of the most significant legislative changes that you've either inspired, um, helped implement, or even directly implemented? Yes, yeah, so I uh, there's so many. Um, I think what awesome. what what's been really interesting for me is is how we've had to utilize. Um, you know, so many different tools in our um, advocate toolbox, meaning that, you know, there's sort of this cycle with, uh, with issues like this, where you, know, you pass a piece of legislation, you implement it, it gets as far, you know, you're only going to pass what the political will will allow you. Um, and then sometimes you have to use the judicial system to force um, people to actually implement the law. Um, and then you go back into cleaning up that legislation. And so, um, you know, when, when we first started um, uh, Americans for Safe Access, like I said, we sort of launched in this, this space uh, around the federal raids that were happening on the, the few um, patient collectives in California. But as we started getting news coverage and people started looking at this organization, we were getting calls from Californians who said, look, we're, we're not afraid of the DEA. We're actually afraid of local police, right? Like, like even though this law had been passed to protect them, 
They were still being arrested. They were still having their medicine taken. And so um, you know, we actually, one of my favorite, we actually sued the California Highway Patrol um, to make them stop taking patients' medicine because they would, um, if they pulled someone over, they would take their medicine then the patient's charges would get dropped. They would go back to get their medicine and um, the police were saying that they couldn't give it back to them because that would be breaking federal law. <laughs> so we were actually um, able to, um, to sue CHP for violating patients' rights um, in a way that one, um, uh, changed the policy for police procedures and pulling a patient over. Two, it made every single CHP officer have to sign and initial <laughs> the policy saying that they had read it. Um, and that, that uh, those protocols actually were, imp were integrated into education for California Highway Patrol. So that was a pretty exciting one. And we actually got um, attorney's fees that allowed us to create a legal department and just start suing everybody. Not really, <laughs> but that was uh, a big change. And then we also, um, you know, in a similar vein, we had, we had passed a law in California um, that allowed counties and cities to create these access programs um, and some of the cities that were, were, you know, refusing to allow the programs, we sued them and actually it ended up in, coming into federal court and answered this sort of national question about um, states being able to implement laws that were in conflict of federal law. So we actually had the, uh, this went up to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court um, that said that actually, you know, states, um, uh, states have to implement the laws that are passed by their land, their their um, governments, even when they're in conflict. And so what happened from that lawsuit was that we had, um, at the time, there were about 16 states that had passed medical cannabis laws, but their governors were, were not implementing them because they said that would be breaking federal law. And because of this lawsuit, all of these states had to start implementing, and then we saw a flood of states um, add these laws. So that's pretty exciting. And then I think one that people are probably the most aware of was the um, the CJS amendment, right? actually stopping the raids. We were able to pass an amendment to the Department of Justice budget, um, uh, which we still have to pass every year, um, that prohibits um, the Department of Justice from uh, you know, going after medical cannabis programs. And so that that's still in place, but it, that's the only law that is protecting uh, state cannabis programs. The adult use programs are actually completely unprotected. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if people know that, but. Well, you're going into my next question here, which is really interesting. Uh, so basically, it seems that the ASA focuses mainly on medical uh, benefits of cannabis and kind of helping roll out the medical market. I'm curious what, if you have an official stance on recreational um, use of cannabis and the laws regarding recreational cannabis. I believe you know, we we don't actually work on adult use um, as far as our focus goes. We, um, as an organization, we don't believe anyone should go to jail for for cannabis or other nonviolent crimes. So um, we never, um, you know, put forward legislative solutions that would create new uh, criminal penalties or increase criminal penalties for people who are outside that system. Uh, I think that. It's pretty obvious that the, the adult use um, uh, market has benefited from everything that we have done. Uh, but we've created a space for that. Uh, but I think that what you know, what um, a lot of people don't understand is that there actually is a very big difference between a patient consumer and an adult use consumer. And what's happening yeah. right now in these states that have both adult use and medical is that patients um, are having to compete with this larger market of adult use um, consumers to try to find companies that will make products for them. And so um, there are a lot of really well-meaning uh, businesses that, you know, that see adult use as an opportunity to, you know, cover their expenses and create a space for them to maybe better serve patients. But at the end of the day, there's only so much shelf space um, in these, in these businesses. And when you have a larger population you know, demanding, you know, the, the sexiest, what's new, you know, <laughs> the new flavor of the month, uh, our new products. And that's really what's driving R&D and innovation. You're, you're absolutely leaving behind patients who 
the last thing we want is something new, right? And something sexy. Once you, um, once you find a product that works for you, you know, you want to know that it's going to be on the shelf the next time you go there. And so what patients are, are finding is that even though, you know, the, the backbone, the infrastructure that these, the adult use programs are utilizing, um, that there isn't a place for us and it, and we haven't, it hasn't increased any of our, any of our rights. So we see states doing things like, you know, cutting sales tax for patients, maybe yeah. at the register, but we still have to pay all this money to get a card in the first place. Right. And uh, yeah. it doesn't mean that they're going to, that card doesn't ensure that we're going to have products just for patients. Right. And yeah. because the, the taxation along the supply chain of the adult use market, those products are, are much more expensive than they need to be. So there's no incentive for businesses to produce products for patients. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really sort of a frustrating experience for patients themselves, but it's sort of drowning out the, uh, you know, the opportunity for patients to uh, express what it, what it is they need. And part of, I think, why there's this misconception is that it, most people, when they hear medical cannabis or medical marijuana, they think of you know, as the state programs, right? That, that, that's what they think of. And, and what people don't understand is that those state programs that we created, they were really supposed to be temporary, right? They were, they were triage for us to get patients off the battlefield of the war on drugs, find a safe place for them to access cannabis, while we removed other barriers that were preventing cannabis from uh, being, you know, part of a national healthcare system, and so the, you know, these programs were meant really just to, to, you know, and we were able to learn a lot from them. Uh, but unless we move to create a market um, where it's, you know, businesses are incentivized to serve to serve us, uh, we're going to keep seeing more of the same, uh, and you know. Criminal exemptions are not the only problem patients have. Yeah, you're kind of tap dancing around what I wanted to ask up next too. So regarding the red card system, and so I, I shared with you privately um, that I'm also a medical patient, um, and so I had to go through lots of hoops to get to that get to that point, including giving up my right to buy guns, uh, paying you know fees every year. What is the ASA stance on this whole process that we have for red cards? Do you think it's ideal? Do you think there are some areas that we can improve or what would you say? Well, the, uh, the, the federal legislation that we are working on would actually um, kind of build on the, those existing medical programs, but actually move them into a prescription program, right? So that, um, you know, there isn't an ID card, right? ID card in a way is like... <laughs> I mean, it's like prove that you're a second class um, citizen Basically. and actually, yeah. And, and, and to be honest, like if you are using recreational cannabis, you're not supposed to have a gun either. Right. So like no one using cannabis uh, has, has those rights. Um, uh, it just may be easier to prove if you have an ID card. Um, but in our vision, you know, the, um, your doctor, you know, your doctor's visit should be covered under insurance, right? If you, if your primary a uh, care physician does not want to uh, write the prescription, then they would could send you to a specialist that's covered um, under your health plan. Um, and then you would, you know, be able to have your medicine actually covered by insurance. So I think that the, um, you know, the, the cards have served a purpose, um, but they're not, uh, again, they were a, a part of a larger picture, right? They were necessary um, uh, at the state level for, for these temporary programs. Um, but they're, you know, they, they shouldn't be a part of, uh, of cannabis, med- can- uh, sorry, cannabis is, uh, future as a medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And so also a little bit before we were talking about uh, social equity and kind of how, um, basically you were saying is that privileged Americans receive access. So I, I kind of wanted to visit back to that a little bit more. Uh, what, what exactly did you mean, um, and what kind of changes do you think we need still on that front? Yeah, I, th- I think what I mean by that is, is you know, cannabis has been um, used by millions of Americans, you know, ever since it became illegal, right? That that hasn't changed, right? But the application of um, uh, the war on drugs is definitely targeted, um, uh, you know 
specific races and yeah. poor people, right? So yeah. if you are a rich white kid, um, your the, the inner the, the likelihood that you'll have an interaction with law enforcement is very different um, than others, and what that law enforcement encounter looks like is very different, right? And so yeah. um, you know, in in a sense that that those privileges that protection was already there when I started Americans for Safe Access, right? So for me personally, um, uh, as a white girl <laughs> you know, um, in California, um, you know, I could have continued to illegally have can of, you know, get cannabis as my medicine and, um, and not been affected in any way, right? But really when we're talking about creating these protections, we're thinking about people that have been the most vulnerable to this war on drugs. And as we as we look forward and actually look at a, the life of a patient today, right, um, and see like you know just because we ha- you know everyone uses the this data point that you know there's cannabis laws in 39 states, um, so let's look and see who actually gets to participate. So first of all, you know, does your doctor know about cannabis? Does a patient even know about cannabis as an option? That's sort of the first barrier. Um, you know, if your doctor does know about it, are they willing to write a recommendation under your healthcare system? If not, then we start getting into the, the financial issues, right? Is your is your condition covered under that that state law? Um, you know, can you pay? Can you afford to pay out of pocket to see another physician? Can you pay for the ID card? Right? And then we get into the sort of bigger questions, which are like, can you pay out of pocket? Um, you know, for for your medication. And because there isn't any stability in the marketplace for these medicines, the experience of a patient is that um, you often have to buy two or three things when you go to a dispensary because you're not really sure if you can trust the label or if that product's going to work for you. And so um, so that's expensive. Like imagine if when you went to pick up a prescription, if you're like, oh, yeah, why don't you throw in a couple more, right? Just to, um, just to see if it's going to work, right? Um, and so that, that's just the, the expense of experimentation. Also, you know, being able to find the time to, to see what the effects are going to be, right? It's not a good idea to try out a new medication on your way to work. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's the real sort of day-to-day life impacts of, you know, can, can I live where I'm living and use medical cannabis? Like, is my, is my landlord going to let me use this product? Um, you know, am, am I in housing that, that, you know, that explicitly won't allow me? Um, is my job going to drug test me? Right. So all of these, um, components are really, um, if the answer to any of those questions is no, then, then cannabis is not an option for you. Right. And and we may not think about, um, the ability to move to a different apartment as a privilege, but it absolutely is, yeah. right? The, the ability to move to another state to take a job, um, that, that is not a possibility for everyone. Yeah. Like one, one other example that I think a lot of people aren't thinking of are, I hear from parents all the time that their, their, their kids who are, you know, um, pediatric cannabis patients who are moving, you know, uh, going to college, they have to really look and see where their kid can go to college because like, for instance, in Oregon, um, there's not a reciprocity program for the medical cannabis program there. And the adult use is 21 and older. So they're like, their kids got into a college in Oregon and they are smuggling cannabis into Oregon for, into Oregon, right? We're like, I'm pretty sure it rains cannabis um, <laughs> for, <laughs> for their student, right? So again, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we take for granted within our, our cannabis journey, um, whether it's legal for everyone or not. And, you know, each one of those items, you know, that I, that I mentioned, you know, that's a barrier for, uh, for people who, you know, um, let's say they, they take a job that's drug testing, they may not have the option to wait another two months to look for another job, right? And so what is that mean? It means that maybe they're having to go back on opioids to to take a job, right? They're they're not getting to choose um, the healthcare journey that could be best for them and their family. Yeah, I'm also curious uh, how you kind of get involved with healthcare professionals. Uh, a little bit ago, you were mentioning how many doctors don't even see cannabis as a viable option for treatment in many cases. And so I'm just curious what you think is the best way to kind of educate and get inside their minds without offending them. It's because, you know, they're doctors, they have all these 
background in uh, education. They think they know a lot. And so how do you deal with that kind of personality and kind of change their mind in a sense and help them consider cannabis as an alternative? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we'd have to have a, a, a whole series of, of other podcasts to dive into the, <laughs> the white, uh, as my friends in Europe call them, the, the white coat mafia. Um, but, uh, the reality is, is that there, there, there is a, there is a system for how doctors learn in this country, right? And, it, and it's a, it, yeah, and it, this sort of goes to the heart of why um, I believe we need an office of medical cannabis and cannabinoid control in HHS, right? Like why we actually need something still for cannabis because Cannabis is um, one like pharmaceutical companies are not going to jump in and and replace what we're seeing in the market, right? Yeah. It's and it's it's not because cannabis isn't medicine; it's because the process to go through an FDA approval process um, to have an, a a medication that is actually um, as efficacious as what people are finding in you know in the um, these the sort of separate market. Um, it, it's it's too expensive, right? And uh, pharmaceutical companies, big pharma, as we like to call them, you know, they're not interested in making a profit. They're interested in making an obscene profit, right? Yeah. Like most of the big the pharma companies in in the U.S., they actually don't deal in generics, right? They will, they'll do anything they possibly can. And cannabis, by its nature, when you put it into that context, is a generic. And so, looking at the then this is a specifically a U.S. problem that, you know, pharmaceutical companies play a really outsized role in our healthcare system, which includes doctor education, right, which includes um, education of pharmacists, which includes, um, you know, how uh, patients interact with medicine altogether. So when we look at how we're going to integrate cannabis into our healthcare system, you have to kind of move, you have to like push big, big pharma aside, right, and say, who is going to do this education? And so, we have been successful in getting states to create these programs. There's a lot of uh, folks that are that are trying to see you know cannabis taught in universities. We have several graduate programs now that are that are incorporating the endocannabinoid system in, into healthcare. Um, but I think that uh, it is true that doctors are more likely to listen to another doctor um, than to their patient. But also, you know the the nature of our healthcare system, you know, they also are under a lot of pressure to, to get you out the door in three minutes. So to think that they are going to learn about the entire endocannabinoid system and um, uh, one meeting is a little hard. But I think secondly, the other sort of big gap that we have to deal with is that I hear from a lot of doctors that they, that they believe that there's medical value in cannabis, right? They believe that, but what they don't know how to do is, like, is to give information to their patients that is going to be meaningful, right? So in our current system, it's really what, what we would call compassionate use. So basically doctors are writing a recommendation, not a, not a prescription, a recommendation. And what they're, you know, the way the laws are written, they're basically saying nothing else has worked. So I'm recommending you try this. And I'm, and you're kind of, the patient is free to figure out the rest on their own. And so for a doctor, that can be pretty scary, right? They don't yeah. know the quality. They don't know the the quantity, they don't know anything, you know, of that, of that, of that component. So we have definitely worked with um, universities to create more continuing medical education. Um, but I think the other thing is, is uh, doctors also believe in, um, in proof, right? And so we, we put yeah. a lot of focus on clinical trials, but in a way patients, we're all like an N of one cannabis study, right? And so while you're, you know, your doctor, may not be the one to write you the recommendation, they're certainly going to notice if you have more mobility the next time they see you, right? And they're only going to attribute that. They're going to be like, wow, I'm amazing. My health really, like, like you are going to have to tell them, actually, your advice did not help me, um, but cannabis is really working, right? And I think the more that, um, that doctors are seeing that empirical data in their own offices, right, it's going to, um, you know, make them spend their, their lunch hour, right. Trying to find more information on this. So, um, you know, some of the kind of boring stuff we do at Americans for Safe Access is, you know, we're trying to get, um, the healthcare, uh, intake forms, right. These electronic medical records to actually create a place for, um, doctors to record that their patient is using cannabis medically, 
right now in most of those forums, there's only a box for cannabis under illicit substances. Yeah. Right. And so that actually, like when a patient is looking at that intake form, they're like, well, my cannabis. No. Is not illicit, right. I'm not, right? But it's also not right. It's not like it's legal. Right. And so like, why would I, like some patients may not even think of that. Um, I just recently, or last year I had, um, had a surgery and I had to like force my doctors to like put my cannabis use in there. And, you know, uh, even the anesthesiologist, I was like, do you know that I use cannabis? And they're like, oh, oh yeah, I guess I see it here. And I was like, so any, like, should I not use it before surgery? You know what I mean? Like they, like, they're like, oh, right. Oh yeah. Yeah. You probably shouldn't. Right. So I wonder Um, if they even know. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, you know, cannabis is a blood thinner, right? Like I probably shouldn't use it. Right. So, um, so there's a lot of work to do on that side, but I think, um, again, we have to think about education, like all the levels of education. So there's accredited education, but there's also social education. There's also, you know, these doc- doctors don't live in a vacuum, right? They're hearing their buddies at the golf course being like, oh, I'm using this CBD oil and it's really working, right? So if they're hearing it, but then also seeing it in their exam room, um, I think that is also going to foster the desire for education, not just um, the the availability of it. Yeah, really great answer. Um, I think uh, my personal opinion, I think kind of misconceptions and uh, propaganda might be part of the culprit as to why doctors are coming slow to coming around. Um, I'm wondering if you agree on that. And also, what are the most common misconceptions you notice in the medical industry uh, regarding cannabis? Yeah, I think the misconceptions, that, I guess there's there's two, two sort of buckets I would put them in. One thing about U.S. Um, healthcare that is just kind of always blows my mind is it's 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 crisis medicine, right? Like it's not about not getting sick; it's about what to do when you're sick, right? So um, we're really good at breaking, you know, fixing broken bones. Um, we're not really that good at like making sure that you are healthy and you know, um, you know, not falling down to break a bone. Right? <laughs> Let's say right, um, and so I think uh, I remember when I first started Americans for Safe Access, I kept hearing. Um, physicians saying um, that medicine isn't about feeling better. And I was like, well, that's dumb, <laughs> right? Like, why, why isn't medicine about feeling better, right? They're, and their point was that they're saying it's about getting better. And I was like, yeah, but a lot of medical conditions, we're not going to get better. So isn't it, isn't quality of life like a pretty good reason, um, you know, to, and we know this now looking at data that's coming out of, out of the States that actually, you know, um, if a patient feels better, they're going to move around more, right? They're going to be more active. They're going to do all of these other things that, you know, take a patient who has, let's say, a, um, a, a back issue or a mobility issue, and then they, they start compounding all these other medical conditions because of lack of mobility, right, um, or depression. So I think that sort of this, this misconception that, like, <laughs> that uh, a part of medicine is, is, isn't is quality of life, right, is, is, is a big hurdle. Um, I would say there is some propaganda, right? Um, but I think there's also the, the propaganda, like, argument, is, it, it's actually two-sided. So, yes, there is the, there's the war on drugs, sort of BS propaganda, this is your brain on drugs, all that good stuff, right? But then there's also the um, cannabis evangelicals, right, that are on the uh-huh. other side of that doctors, right? And so what I hear often from doctors is, you know, a patient will find a a synopsis of a research study from a pro-marijuana website. It was in a newsletter, right? And the, not only is the synopsis not correct, right? But it's something like, they're like, you know, could cannabis cure Alzheimer's? And when you get down into the study, um, it, it was like two rats, right? And right, like, uh, it's, it's just like not very helpful information. Like, but the patient bringing this into the doctor really like, hey, I need this, right? And so the doctor's like, um, yeah, this, this this isn't helpful for me, right? Um, uh, or also, you know, maybe it is a study that's actually a well designed research study um, that a doctor's looking at, and then they ask their patient, okay, well, where, how can I get you the cannabis that was used in this study? I'm like, oh, what do you yeah, mean? It's like, like, yeah, so like this, th- where is this cannabis, right? Um, and so, you know, part of um, the evolution um, of, of cannabis that needs to happen, my fear is that if this doesn't happen, where medical cannabis is going to be 
relegated just to wellness, right? And to me, when I hear the term wellness, although I think it should be integrated into our healthcare system, uh, wellness to me just means it's, a, it's like privileged medicine, right? If you have insomnia, that's a medical condition unless you can pay out of pocket for a solution. Yeah. All right. right. So, um, uh, but but I get just one last point on the 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 doctors and sort of propaganda is that um, the the um, with within the sort of drug abuse um, or addiction specialist uh, community, it's now the you know it, this huge billion dollar industry, right? Um, that actually a lot of people who were um, and drug policy reform kind of latched on to in a lot of ways, right? Like you know, let people go to treatment, treatment instead of incarceration, that sort of um, uh, view. You know, drug treatment centers make a lot of money, right? They're, they're, there's an interest in there being a cannabis use disorder. And there's a lot of controversy over, over that concept. But um, it is cannabis use disorder is classified as a medical condition right now. All right, like that, that it, it's, it's something that doctors are being taught. And so um, if that's the only information you're getting about cannabis, right? Like you can see why a doctor would be hesitant to recommend it. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not judging any of those components. I'm just kind of painting a reality that like if you, if you have been told, right, that, that there's this possibility that your patient could develop this, this horrible disorder and your patient is coming in and, and asking for a medication that there are, in fact, other medications that can treat that condition, right? That, you know, a lot of people choose cannabis over other medications because of quality of life issues. Then a, then a doctor is going to say, look, you know, yes, there are these other problems with X, Y, and Z medication, but I know that the, you won't develop cannabis use disorder <laughs> from using them. So you, know, you could get, what's the word for opioid, opioid use disorder, in my case with chronic pain, if, if that's the alternative, like there, there is no, there is. Yeah. Right. So that, so that might be an example where the doctor weighs the two and says, okay, well, I guess cannabis use disorder is, 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 is isn't as bad as opioid use disorder. Um, but these are, but this is, but this is the education that doctors are getting, right? I just want to be clear that it's yeah. not, um, uh, and, um, you know, this is, we're a very litigious society, right? Doctors are, are um, most doctors, you know, are now part of these bigger systems, right? Of, of like a Kaiser group, like you, like a lot of our doctors are part of these bigger um, systems and their attorneys just tell them, don't do it. They're like, just don't, just don't do it. Right. And so a lot of doctors, um, you know, their, their attorneys have said, you know, you can't do it. So they're also super busy. And so they're, maybe they're not taking that extra time to learn about it if they already know that it's not something that they can do anyway, right? And I know, you know, and it creates a lot of controversy over the sort of, you know, what's a cannabis specialist versus like what's a pot doc, right? Um, you know, um, script, script mills, right? Or, or something we, that, are, that are not, um, you know, just uh, related to cannabis, right? During the opioid uh, crisis and today, right? There are doctors that will go and just write you a prescription without anything else for um, for pain medications. And in the the cannabis space, um, you know, there's a lot of doctors who will not write recommendations. So whether or not we like the idea of pot docs or, um, and hopefully I'm, you know, I'm starting to see that evolve more into cannabis specialists, they're sort of a necessary evil in a way, right? And until we can get cannabis um classified as, you know, needing a specialist and that those specialists get covered under our, our health insurance. But, you know, I know um, just, you know, direct family members who you know, have, who have talked to their doctors about cannabis and their doctors have said like, yeah, that's a great idea. And they say, oh, great. My niece told me I need you to fill this out. <laughs> right? I mean, um, and the doctor said, yeah, no, I don't do that. Um, but you should pick up a, an OC weekly and find one of the docs in the ads Right. So like doctors are like recommending the, these doctors. So um, there's definitely a lot of um, um, you know, education that needs to happen to, to get beyond that. But I would just say that the, the propaganda 
isn't just against. Sometimes propaganda can come for, like there's definitely, I've met a lot of patients that are like, put cannabis in the water. <laughs> um, I guess you can buy cannabis water now, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think that like, you know, the, the fact is, is that like cannabis, there are a lot of people that should not take cannabis. Um, and when a doctor isn't presented with that information, you know, they, it's just like a lawyer is taught to think about things in a certain way. Doctors are taught to think about things in a certain way. And in the U S um, another layer of that is don't get sued. Right. So like, that's a part of their medical experience. Yeah. Re really good information. Um, this is actually really insightful. I just, thank you for being here. Just, we're starting to wind down a little bit. I just got like three, four more questions if that's okay. okay. Of um, course. Uh, this next one is regarding other people who are kind of like you and want to be activists and want to implement change, uh, but not quite sure how to get started, who to talk to. And so maybe, for example, they're in one of those states, let's use Texas as an example, um, where they would just love to get the medical and then obviously eventually adult use market going. And they just don't know what to do. What advice would you give to them to get started? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing I just want, oh, um, uh, I'm going to correct some language you said. Yeah. Yeah. Quick. Please, please, because, please. No, because it, it's, it, and, and I, and I think this is kind of a, it's a, it's a, it seems like a very simple misunderstanding, but it, but it's having some major consequences. And that is adult use is not the end goal of medical. So when you, and what you, what you just said is like people who want to see medical and then eventually adult use, yeah. um, that actually patients want to see medical functioning programs, right? And adult use just happens to benefit from our work. So yeah. you don't, and I think that this, I've started seeing in the media um, coverage that there are 24 states with um, uh, adult use programs and another 14 with um, medical programs. That is not accurate, right? There are 38 states with medical programs and 24 that add adult use. So it's, it's important. Um, so I just want to uh, yeah, yeah. make sure that people know that you can work on medical without, and, and that the, the point of medical isn't adult use. So just real quick. Um, sorry. And I was just writing something up about that <laughs> today, but it seems, and, and the, it is sort of what things look like. It's the observation of what's happening, um, but it but it isn't the in, the intention of, of the work that we're doing. So the, the first thing that people should understand is that all of the access that exists in the United States that that was brought to you by patient advocates and um, cannabis reform advocates, right? Like there, yes, there are lots of businesses. People talk a lot about the industry, um, but the industry is a byproduct of activism, right? So, um, so if you don't like the laws in your land and you want to see them get better, then um, then there's all sorts of ways you can plug in. Uh, there's actually, you said uh, Texas. We actually have several chapters. Um, we have a Texas chapter. Um, it's working on reforming the laws in the state. Uh, you can come to our website and sign up in the volunteer section, um, and we can plug you into various programs. But I think the you know the first thing is is to kind of see who else is out there, right? There's a lot of people working on this, uh, and 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 you, know, you can plug into the campaigns that they're doing. Um, but you can also you know look at at your um, your your closest environment, like what do your friends and family think about, about cannabis? What, what, what do they know about it? Right. Um, is there, you know, education that needs to happen at home and, and then sort of ripple out. Uh, and, you know, we have all sorts of resources for, um, patient advocates on our website. We actually have a, uh, a resource center for advocates. So we can, everything from breaking down how laws are made, right. The, um, the process of, of sort of where things are, how to um, uh, read legislation or propose legislation and understand it, um, to how to um, organize an event in your community. We have uh, trainings on um, how to uh, testify before a government body, how to um, hold a press conference, how to speak to the media. Uh, so, you know, uh, activism, just like anything else, is something you learn, right? It's a, it's the, there's a whole toolbox that's available, and and none of it's rocket science, right? And we won't make you get a degree to, to use it. Um, that it's really, you know, if it if you haven't been uh, involved uh, in political discourse, it may seem like this mist, you know, mystifying thing that happens. But really, it's people who want to see change and 
uh, you know, plug in and, and become a part of that change. Yeah, and coming up for this year, twenty the rest of twenty twenty four, going into twenty twenty five. Do you have any fun initiatives, campaigns, events that you'd like to share? Absolutely. So we have this really fun ca- campaign called the Compassionate Candidate, right? And I think this is this really goes to the you know you know, in your in your face, what's happening in front of you campaign that actually every single person in the United States can participate in because every single congressional seat is up every two years, right? So the person who represents you in Congress is applying for their job right now. Um, And they actually are more willing to answer questions and engage right now than they will be for the next two years. Um, And a third of you, a third of the the folks living in the U.S., your senator, one of your senators is also um, applying for the job. So um, every six years, um, that Senate seat is up, but they're rotated into three different groups, right? So not not every senator is up for re-election at the same time. Um, and you can uh, go to the Compassionate Candidate, CompassionateCandidate.org, and we have resources for you to find all this information and find your the people that are applying for the job to represent you. And we've created a pledge for candidates to sign, saying that they, you know, if they're elected um, into office, that they will. Uh, pass comprehensive medical cannabis legislation. So this uh, campaign, it includes a toolkit for you, for advocates, um, to learn how to talk about medical cannabis, how to ask questions. Uh, We have guides to like how to get questions asked at debates, um, how to make medical cannabis a part of um, your campaign, uh, or their campaigns really, but how to make it part of the the dialogue uh, for getting that job. And then we have tools for you to give to the candidate to explain. So we have a, a, a toolkit for you to literally just hand it over to them. But during this time, uh, I would say, you know, national organizations have the least amount of influence, right? Because these people are applying for the job and they need your vote. So you have the most influence right now um, in asking these candidates what they what they intend to do about medical cannabis. So um, it's a fun campaign. It's uh, we've created um, social media shares. We've created you know toolkits for every aspect. We even have a draft email that you would send to the candidate to ask them where they stand. So um, you know, and that has a short window. The election's right around the corner. Um, but if you're looking for something that you can do to have impact, uh, major impact for the next two years, that's definitely a place that you know, if you if you spent um, a couple minutes a day until the election, you could see um, a huge return in the next congressional session. Yeah, great idea. Can, can you share um, the link with me just so I can kind of get that in the video description? Um, and then, yes, uh, absolutely. I'll, um... Sweet, yeah. And then also to kind of come full circle here, um, how can people support the ASA? And so I know we kind of touched upon this earlier, but um, somebody listening or somebody who finds you, what are the best ways to support you and what you're doing? So is it, the first thing is sign up. Um, you know, it's free to get on our alerts. Um, you know, we'll make sure you know what sort of what's happening. Um, become a member, um, of course, is always helpful. Like I said, like we talked about earlier, like we really depend on individual donations. And I think um, a lot of times people don't give because they don't think that that, you know, that membership, that, that $35 is really going to help. And I'm telling you that $35 is huge, right? That keeps our, um, it pays for our website to keep going. It pays for, for uh, people to, um, uh, to look over legislation and do these alerts. So um, there isn't an amount that's too small, right? Um, or too big, but <laughs> but uh, I think that that you shouldn't let um, um, a small ask uh, feel like it, it. You know, it's not going to have a big impact. Um, once you're, you know, once you go to sign up uh, on the you know, on our website, um, we'll we'll actually ask you a bunch of questions and see sort of how you want to engage. Um, uh, there's all the different types of ways you can volunteer, and some of them are are about just bringing awareness to things that you're already doing, right? So um, I always ask people um, to tell me sort of how they how they describe themselves, right? Like how, how would you describe yourself? Are you, like some people say, I'm a mother, um, I'm a student, I'm, um, 
uh, I'm a Republican, right? What, you know, whatever sort of idea, there's an opportunity for you to educate and for you to be an advocate within, within those circles. And so we've done a lot of work to help bridge existing issues into, into cannabis and, and help you become a, an advocate in your, um, in your daily life. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you do. You guys are awesome. Um, and so I just want to, once again, congratulate you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, we'll definitely leave all the links uh, to get involved with the ASA in this video description. Um, and then just a few more kind of fun questions, simple questions for you, if that's okay. Um, first of all, I'm really curious about the first time you tried cannabis, if you could share that story. Yeah, I, I grew up in uh, in Texas and um, honestly, nothing happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I, and, and to tell you even a funnier story, the first time I I, I got medical cannabis, like it was like um, my sort of story of finding cannabis in, in Southern California. Um, I didn't, I, I said to the person, like, that's not cannabis. And I, and it, cause it was like a flower and it was like, there was like purple colors and it was all like crystally or something. Oh, yeah, that is it was like something like out of a Dr. Seuss book or something. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what is that? Like, it's cannabis. And I was like, no, cannabis is brown. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so nothing. Yeah. I remember ha like a, being at a friend's house and they had leaves out like cannabis leaves out drying and they were microwaving. I don't know. So, so yeah, so I don't, uh, I didn't have a, a, uh, a very exciting experience with cannabis before, before it became my medicine. You know, it's funny is a lot of people say that a lot of people say the same thing. They, the first time they didn't really feel it, it was just kind of, yeah. And I guess you just part of the club there. Um, also these days, part of that is that, yeah, it's, a, ahead, it's actually, a, it's a, it's a, it, there's actually a scientific reason for it. Um, which is, um, which has to do with your endocannabinoid system, right? That if you're, if you have a healthy endocannabinoid system, um, and we also look at like what the potency was of cannabis, and I think it was, this is more true, um, you know, for 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 people older, right? The, the, the cannabis uh, um, experience they're having, it, it just might not have been enough to alter their the endocannabinoid system, right? That that their endocannabinoid system wasn't. Um, didn't recognize um, phytocannabinoids, right? And so when, um, and for those same people who had the experience when they were earlier, sometimes they have really negative experiences when they're trying cannabis today, right? Because it's a, um, you know, it's a much more potent experience, I'll say. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous these days with like these edibles and like the flower percentages. It's ridiculous. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's another thing going back to the sort of difference between adult use and, and, uh, and medical, you know, when I when I had my surgery, I was looking for an edible. Usually, I use a tincture, but there, it's alcohol based, and I didn't want to use that with an opioid, right? Um, Post surgery, and cannabis is not good by itself um, for acute pain. And so, I was looking for an edible to take post surgery, and I couldn't find a, a gummy anywhere that was below twenty milligrams. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, wait a second, like who, like who, why? 20 milligrams is a, is a, is, first of all, it's not a dose, right? That's two doses um, for, uh, for the adult use person. But like, they're like, oh, just take a fourth of it. I was like, okay, take a fourth of this tiny thing. Okay, come on. <laughs> so. no, is that, is that how are you going to know what, what part of the THC is in it? It's, just, it's not like going to be evenly divided throughout the gummy. At least you don't think. I don't know. But um, uh, just a couple more questions for you that we can yeah. wrap this up. I know we've been going for a while here, and so I definitely respect your time. Um, What's your favorite cannabis product these days? So I actually, talking about privileged, um, I actually um, have um, caregivers that cultivate um, a, a cannabis cultivar of my, that that has worked for me. Um, huh? That I, I trust how they uh, that they do it organically. That it, that it's it, it's done with medicine in, in mind, and I uh, I make my own tincture. Huh. Awesome. That's, that's really cool. It's a lot healthier probably too. Man, good for your lungs. All that. Yeah, it, but again, yeah. that's, I, and I, and the reason I, you know, um, the reason I say that's a, because I know that's not an option for everyone. Right. And yeah. so, you know, we do definitely support home cultivation um, laws. That's part of our, our framework is to make sure that people can cultivate um, or have someone cultivate for them. Um, but um, you know, I, I had used a dispensary system for a while, but I, I just, couldn't find someone to keep what I needed in stock. And I, um, 
you know, have an issue that, you know, after a few days without having this medication, I start losing mobility. And so I, you know, I was fortunate enough to find, find a way to make that work for me, but that's, but I'm not advocating for that for everyone. Cause I know that again, that that is a very privileged way to, to use this medicine. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Congrats to you. I, uh, I'm almost an oil guy. Thanks for guys. It's the way to go. Privileged, privileged power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lastly, I, I, I'm not toasting to that. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably not the right choice of words, whatever, whatever. I mean, don't, don't have a filter sometimes. But anyways, uh, last question. Look, looking into your crystal ball, what you know, in the next five, ten years, what is going to be the future of the cannabis industry? Well, I'd say I have I have two crystal balls. Um, I, have a, I have a crystal ball that um, is, a, is the crystal ball where we actually – see medical cannabis be part of that future. And then I have the crystal ball that's sort of kind of where I'm afraid things are going, um, where, where medical isn't a part of that conversation. So for the, for my crystal ball, that's the happy, happy ball, (laughs) I guess, um, is, is that, uh, cannabis, uh, is integrated into our healthcare system that, um, that doctors, um, can write, um, prescriptions for a variety of different delivery methods and a variety of different cannabinoids. Um, and again, I'm not talking about the pharmaceuticalization of cannabis. I'm talking about the, um, the maturity of the healthcare system to understand a, a plant medicine. Um, there would be a, um, through the Office of Medical Cannabis and Cannabinoid Control, um, in about five to 10 years, the research priority map that we have created, we'll start seeing research from that. So we'll be able to see uh, product um, development really be targeted more towards what patients need and what, what's really working. Um, five to 10 years, we would see um, the results of cannabis being integrated into Medicare um, and to our VA system. So we'd, we'd be seeing on some of that knowledge. Um, there would be standardized terminology. Um, so the information that's in a research study would be the same thing that a doctor is going to be uh, learning about, the same thing that a patient is going to be seeing in their product, and the same thing that product uh, developers are going to see, right? So all of, all of the, this experiment is going to, is actually, we're going to be able to put it all together and, and to create better medicines. Um, and we're, we're probably going to see um, a lot less opioid deaths. We're going to see, you know, healthier, um, healthier humans. Um, in the crystal ball where medical gets pushed aside and the only thing that advances um, is adult use is, is we're gonna, we would see, uh, I often hear people say that they want to see cannabis regulated like tobacco or alcohol. I'm sure you've heard people say that. Yeah. I don't think they know what that means, right? So um, uh, I think they're thinking about the taxes maybe that they see it everywhere and it's taxed. But actually, the FDA regulates tobacco, and they started doing so in 2009, um, probably about when you stop seeing all the fun stuff about tobacco, right? Like, that's where all the flavors went away. Um, it's where tobacco companies were prohibited from sponsoring sporting events or, or <sighs> being a part of that part of, of the program. Um, and so we, we would probably see a very limited um, uh, number of allowed um uh, cannabinoid products. Uh, we'd also see very much like alcohol, a cap on, um, on, on the existing THC. So, um, right now the, and that would be like 10 milligrams. So is a serving. So probably caps on those servings. So all the concentrates would probably go away. Um, none of the flavors that you haven't been proven, um, safe for human consumption for inhalation, all of that would go away. Um, any of the minor cannabinoids um, besides THC and CBD, they would have to actually go through a process of proving their safety. Yeah. Uh, so a very expensive process. Um, you can look in, at the Tobacco um, uh, Control Act and see what the, the FDA requires for a new um, tobacco product to be allowed. Like that would, that's what would be applied. Um, and that crystal ball isn't, isn't me just sort of making up that that would happen. If you actually look at the two um, bills, um, the adult use bills, the MORE Act and um, the the COA, 
Um, they, they both actually call for a center in the FDA and it, the language actually looks exactly like the Tobacco Control Act. So um, I think that the, the, you know, we just, we'd see a lot of limited research, right? There wouldn't be um, as much uh, um, variety um, in the markets for, for research and for, for use. Um, and it would be very expensive <laughs> with taxes at the federal and state level. Um, and I have a feeling that your favorite tobacco or alcohol company would probably have the majority of the market. Yeah. Huh. Really great information, Steph. Um, okay. Really insightful. Learned a lot. Uh, th thanks for being here and talking with me. Um, definitely wish you all the best. I'm going to leave all the links. Uh, please send me the, the links for the the election stuff you're talking about. And I'll leave your uh, URL for your LinkedIn and also the ASA website in the video description below. But just wanted to wish you all the best. Um, thanks again thanks for everything sir. that you yeah. do. Um, we'll be in touch. I, I appreciate that, Sam. And I just, I, I just, if I could just get, leave with one one final thought. Um, yeah, absolutely. That I want to be clear is that absolutely. I don't think that um, that the medical use and adult use. Um, is an either or scenario. Um, and I and and nothing that um, that we're doing in medical cannabis um, is setting up that scenario, right? but but we but we're creating a space to focus on medical cannabis. Um, I think that there can be a world where there is medic, you know medical and adult use. And if I seem defensive and sort of focusing on medical, it's because uh, we're not seeing that same respect on the other side. It seems like yeah. those who who want um, adult use, are setting up an either or scenario. Yeah. Um, and I don't think um, that everyone understands um, what an either or scenario means for patients. So um, I uh, just want to make sure that your your listeners are understanding that I'm, I'm, I'm not disrespecting uh, re uh, re recreational consumers. Um, I think that probably many of them find will find that they are maybe in fact um, medical cannabis users <laughs> um, in the long run. But um, but, you know, I just ask people to be mindful um, that if they are supporting adult use um, legislation and programs, that they are creating a space for medical. Yeah. And that doesn't mean just less taxes or creating a different line for us to stand in at the dispensary. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And you're doing great work. So thank Thanks, you Sam. so much for everything you're doing. I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you.